Hello, welcome to the Submarine Force Museum. I'm Commander Brad Boyd, Director of the Museum and Officer in Charge of the Storkship Nautilus. Today we're going to be finishing our discussion about the uh, Mark 14 torpedo. Now in the two previous spotlights that we had done, uh, the first one we talked about the overall characteristics and, and operating parameters of the torpedo. The next one we talked about the design and production woes that plagued the Mark 14 torpedo. And today we're going to talk about um, uh, the problems that the submarine force experienced once it was in service and they were using it in the war. And there are a total of four problems that the submarine force found. One was that it ran too deep. Uh, another was that it detonated prior to actually reaching the target. Uh, third was once it got to the target, it would strike the target and then not detonate. And fourth, it was a circle run. Now, it wasn't every single time. This was an intermittent problem, but it was significant enough that they had issues with it, right? So the problem of it running too deep, uh, multiple skippers had set up what they considered to be the uh, perfect shot, only to have their torpedo not detonate it do nothing, but they could still hear it operating. So it hadn't just like hit the target and fallen to the bottom of the ocean or hadn't just, you know, gone, uh, uh, engine stopped and just, and just fallen. It ran to the target and they could still hear it going long after it was supposed to have hit the target. Um, and so they were reporting this back to Commander Submarine Pacific um, and Admiral Lockwood, Rear Admiral Lockwood, when he first got there, uh, he'd just taken over, was getting these reports um, and ordered a depth setting test. So. Uh, he coordinated with uh, Rear Admiral Fife, who is the officer that he relieved, um, and as part of his outgoing duties as uh, Submarine Pacific, they set up a test and they had the uh, skipjack fire a single torpedo in a net. The net, we know the dimensions of the, of the net, the torpedo, uh, the, uh, the submarine skipjack was 850 yards off from the net. They shoot the torpedo. The torpedo is set to run at 10 feet, so if here's the surface, it's going to run 10 feet below the surface. And it hit the net at 25 feet. So they order, they do a couple more tests, uh, Admiral Fife supervises, and they figure out that the average depth setting error is 11 feet. So if it's set to run at 10 feet, it's gonna run at 21 feet. So they report to the Chief of Naval Operations, the CNO, uh, Admiral King, who is slightly displeased, we'll leave it at that, at this, and immediately goes and uh, um, tears into Bureau of Ordnance who had been denying that this is a problem and saying it's just operator error and that's what the, all the issues are. Um, so they run an investigation because it was not just the Mark 14, which was the submarine torpedo, it was also the Mark 15, which was the surface torpedo uh, shot from destroyers. So they go and do an investigation and they figure out that there's uh, two issues. One, the uh, uh, depth control mechanism is improperly uh, designed and tested. Uh, so they use the same mechanism design as from previous torpedoes, which is fine except for the fact that previous torpedoes ran slower. Um, they were at 30 knots and the uh, Mark 14 here is at 45 knots, so it's a 50% speed increase. And uh, they moved where the control mechanism was. So it used to be dead center of the torpedo and they moved it to the tail cone. The layout of the torpedo made it easier for controlling the surfaces, all that. What the engineers didn't realize was the pressure, uh, senses that, uh, pressure changes that it sensed that there were gonna be different than what it had in the center of the torpedo and so it's inputting the wrong air. Now, the way the depth control mechanism works is it, it gets a pressure change, it goes, okay, so I'm this far off of depth based off the pressure that I sense, so therefore I'm too shallow, and I need to input an uh, a increase in the, in the dive of the stern plane, so angle the stern planes to dive so that water goes this way, torpedoes that way, pushes the stern plane down. So the stern plane goes down, uh, forcing the torpedo down, and then it goes, okay, I've hit depth, I need to change out, okay, I'm too deep, and it comes back up. And the mechanism is designed to do that in a slow process, so it's not just an immediate correction like this, because then you'll get the torpedo just going like this, never actually hitting depth. So it does it in a slow rate, so therefore it kind of cones in on depth at a slower rate and is able to actually stabilize. Um, so anyways, it was having an issue because of where it was located, it's got the wrong pressure changes, and then it's doing it at a higher speed. So it's messing it up at a high rate of speed, right? Um, and then the other problem was, since they never did a live fire test of this torpedo, they never put an actual warhead in the torpedo, and they never knew the actual performance of the torpedo with that weight there. And they didn't simulate a good weight for the warhead. Uh, and when they designed this, the weight, the warhead's mass was less. They designed it with a, lo a lower yield warhead, and then decided that they should have a bigger one, added more mass, and they never went back and redesigned the depth settings that would should go with that weight. So they do all those combined together, uh, we have the torpedoes running at the wrong depth. So the second problem, uh, magnetic influence exploder and premature detonation, 
Uh, at the end of 1942, August of 1942, depth control issue is now resolved. And so now it's unmasking the other issues that are going on with the torpedo. Um, and so the next problem they reported, uh, multiple torpedoes were detonating too early. Um, it either happened far short of the target, so you know you launch the torpedo and 15 seconds later it detonates and it's you know, 45 seconds to a minute and a half prior to getting to the target, or immediately prior to um, striking the target, it would detonate. And so that is almost imperceptible by the submarine commanders because you can't, it's like a second difference, uh, but the target would drive away with no damage showing uh, or, or minimal damage, not, not anything that a torpedo actually doing its job would, would represent. Um, so uh, this is actually caused by one of two things. Either the torpedo uh, detected a magnetic field change uh, due to operating in shallow water, um, and when you're in shallow water, the earth is closer to the top of the ocean where the torpedo is working, and so therefore um, its magnetic influence field is closer to the torpedo, and so natural occurrences have a higher chance of setting the torpedo off. And if the torpedo changed course or changed depth, it would detect that change in the magnetic field, register that it was supposed to explode, and do so. Um, the other uh, problem that could happen is the uh, torpedo would get up close to the ship, and it's designed to detect the magnetic influence field of the ship. And so the magnetic influence field of the ship goes out in all directions, um, and would detect it horizontally before it got to it uh, directly underneath the keel. And so it would actually come in and then detonate uh, close aboard the ship, but not actually cause uh, any damage or no significant damage and the target would drive away. So the problem was because we talked about the torpedo shortages uh, and the production shortages in the previous spotlight, um, submarine leadership was very hesitant to take the Mark 14 out of the service to remove the mechanisms and then put it back into service. Uh, so they were trying to stick it out and, uh, and leaving it up to the ships to figure it out. So the submarine commanders would then go out to sea and immediately order surgery on their torpedoes and remove the, exploder, the, uh, the magnetic influence detectors uh, from their exploding devices and uh, basically perform illegal maintenance on the torpedoes. This is all not allowed to be done, right? And so they would then go up and everything's set to contact detonation. Well, that changes your tactics. So a magnetic influence, you'd fire, say, one or two torpedoes for a smaller ship. A contact spread, you'd fire four or five, based off the, limp, the reduced damage that a contact detonation does, vice a magnetic influence a detection for where the, where the warhead detonates, and the likelihood of striking your target. Magnetic influence gives you a little bit more leeway for um, uh, uh, errors in the torpedo, because it's going to detonate when it's close to the target, not when it's hit the target. So you'd fire a spread for contacts. But you can't just find your war patrol if you're using magnetic influence like you're required to while you fire a spread. So they'd inflate the size of the target that they're shooting at to justify the switch in tactics to a spread formation of torpedoes um, and, and, and therefore justify the number spent. Finally, after um, uh, the USS Wahoo and uh, Commander Dudley Mushmorton, one of the more famous um, uh, submarine skippers of World War II, they came up with a dry patrol, and it wasn't because they didn't find contacts. They fired torpedoes, and they detonated prematurely. Um, the Admiral Lockwood agreed that, okay, this is an issue. And they went to Bureau of Ordnance, and Bureau of Ordnance uh, looked at it and said, mm, nope, it's actually still the, it's still the submariner's fault. It's just their operating settings. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, even though they sent an expert out to a boat to observe it, he noted no deficiencies and still said it was the submarine's fault. So there's no bad blood there. Um, Bureau of Ordnance said it's only about a 2% error rate, which is acceptable. There's going, to be, there's going to be errors in your weapons. The submariners were reporting close to about 10%, very unacceptable. Um, in reality, it's probably even worse than that. So Admiral Lockwood goes to uh, Admiral Nimitz, um, who is Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet, pitches his case to him, and the next day, so on June 24, 1943, Admiral Nimitz orders all exploder mechanisms, uh, magnetic influence exploder mechanisms, secured throughout his uh, area of command. So every submarine immediately secures the exploder with the exception of those based out of Australia because they fall under a different chain of command. And their immediate boss, the, their equivalent of Admiral Lockwood, um, Rear Admiral Christie, refused to believe that it was uh, the weapon's fault. He th assisted it had to be his uh, skippers, possibly because it was, he was in on the design of the exploder mechanism and that could be some bias in there. Um, and it wasn't until the end of 1943 when Rear Admiral Christie's boss um, was relieved uh, that his, his new boss ordered him to then secure everything in the Australian submarines as well, and then all the submarines had that secured.
All right, so now that the uh, magnetic influence detector is taken offline, so that's not the issue anymore. The, test, the uh, operating depth of the torpedo is fixed, so that's not an issue anymore. We uncover the third problem, which is the contact of uh, the torpedo won't actually detonate on striking the contact on multiple occasions. So this is the contact exploder. Um, couldn't have been found before this because there's other factors causing the torpedo not to work. So multiple uh, skippers were reporting on many occasions that they would hit the contact and the torpedo would literally bounce off. And we were, we were actually decrypting uh, intercepts of Japanese communications with Project Ultra um, and hearing them report that they have torpedoes stuck in their ships. So in merchant, undetonated uh, torpedoes sticking out of the merchants and, and warships. So we know that there's something's causing the torpedo not to hit even though it's actually striking the contact. Um, and the most egregious problem with this was um, uh, the USS Tenosa, which fired a 4,000 yard shot at an angle against a Japanese merchant, struck it and goes dead in the water, but it didn't sink. So the skipper moves over to on the beam, which is the desired spot for two reasons. One, you get the biggest profile as opposed to a narrow on profile. So hitting the broad side of the barn. He's only 875, 850 yards away um, and he's shooting at this thing and he shoots nine torpedoes and every single one of them bounces off. Um, and so that causes the, uh, the skipper to realize, I think I have a bad production run. And so he saves his final torpedo and goes back to Pearl Harbor and turns it in to be examined, and they couldn't find anything wrong. So with that, Admiral Lockwood ordered a series of tests. He started off by shooting torpedoes into um, a sea cliff on uh, Kualave, one of, the Pacific, one of the Hawaiian Islands, and they're finding errors with that. So then he takes a torpedo, and he takes the warhead out and puts sand in there, so the same mass, um, and then they take that torpedo and they hoist it up on a crane to 90 feet in the air, so that way when it travels its full 90 feet, uh, the acceleration from falling, uh, will actually cause it to be going 45 knots. And when it strikes the ground, they then go look at the exploder mechanisms to see if the firing pin fired to tell the warhead, which isn't there, so it didn't actually go boom, but see if it sent the signal for the warhead to detonate. They found that it failed 70% of the time. Um, and so they go to the Bureau of Ordnance, Bureau of Ordnance agrees, okay, fine, this is an issue. And they find out that the firing pin is binding. Um, and it's because of the broad shots, and that's why the angled shots were actually working. There's too much energy being transferred because the mechanism was based off of a previous torpedo, which only went 30 knots as opposed to 45 knots. 50% speed increase, massive increase in the, uh, in the kinetic energy transferred, um, and so therefore the metal couldn't take it. So the short-term fix was they actually took metal, <coughs> and we didn't know about this alloy prior to, we took a metal alloy uh, that we discovered on the downed Japanese aircraft in Pearl Harbor, um, we took that metal alloy, added it to our inventory, and we used that because it's strong but lightweight, and that actually let the firing pin work. And then, uh, so by uh, September of 1943, the firing pin issue is fixed, at least on the temporary side, and the long-term fix was they redesigned it to be a ball switch um, with an electronic signal as opposed to the mechanical signal to tell the warhead to detonate. So but that's how we got through the uh, uh, contact splitter probe. So, the final issue was actually a unique issue to itself. It wasn't dependent upon uh, the other three issues being discovered. Um, and it was a problem that plagued the torpedo throughout World War II um, and, and beyond uh, in reality until we finally found a system to fix it. And that was a circular run. And so that's where the torpedo goes out of the tube, puts a rudder on, uh, turn left or right, and just keeps going in a circle. Now the reason this happens is the gyroscope fails. So the gyroscope was used to determine what course the torpedo's on. So it, it goes, okay, I'm on course 100, 10 degrees south of going due east, right? Um, I'm on course 090, I'm going due east. Um, and it compares that to what the torpedo is mechanically set on for what course they want the torpedo to go. And that's set mechanically on it so it doesn't change. Well, if the gyroscope fails, and let's say that uh, it's supposed to be going due east, 090, and the gyroscope says, hey, I'm going 100, so 10 degrees off, and it needs to come left to come back to it. Uh, if it has failed, no matter what course the torpedo is actually on, it's going to read that it's going 100 and that the course it's supposed to drive is 090. So it's always going to read that it has a 10 degree error and it's always going to put a left rudder on. So it just holds the left rudder and the torpedo just circles around, or right rudder as the case may be, right? And so then it comes back and the, the ship has to, uh, submarine has to try to dodge. It happened at least 24 times that we know of in World War II. Um, and in two cases, that actually sunk the submarine. And this was Mark 14s, Mark 18s. I said it wasn't years until years later we finally came up with an anti-circular runs feature that was independent of the gyroscope, um, so that uh, if it turned too much, it would shut the torpedo down. Um, but that that pro plagued us throughout World War II. Well, this completes uh, the artifact spotlight uh, of the Mark 14.
Um, I hope you enjoyed today's tour. If you have any questions, please let us know. With that, thanks.